Let's go back in time to the mid-2000s, a time before the Marvel Cinematic Universe was made, let alone the juggernaut it is today. Unless you wanted to be out of the loop, network television was the primary source of long-form narrative entertainment. YouTube was still mostly just cat videos, and Netflix, while a popular rental service, wouldn't popularize streaming until years later. Meaning when a show was a hit, especially worldwide, you knew you were doing something right. By 2006, ABC was on top of the world with the massively successful show Lost and had practically no competition. It wasn't difficult to understand why Lost became such a hit. A show played with mystery populated with an ensemble cast from various nationalities, allowing it to reach a much wider audience than, say, the American-centric concerns of shows like Jericho or 24. Lost was everywhere, and everyone wanted a piece of its success. Which brings us to the making of what would be seen as Lost's direct competitor in the fall of 2006, Heroes. Heroes was the brainchild of Tim Kring, screenwriter and showrunners on shows such as Strange World and Crossing Jordan. Tim was inspired by the idea of a long-running epic tale featuring interwoven storylines from characters all over the world. Characters that could have the chance to help what he believed was a dangerous and distraught world that needed saving. Initially believing in the idea of a copper medical drama like his previous works, he shifted focus to a more niche concept. Superheroes. While there had been successful superhero properties in the past, they were regulated to the realms of film and children's cartoons. Unlike the current landscape with shows under the DC Arrowverse or the MCU Defenders, live-action superheroes were rarely done. The only one of note within the half-decade before Heroes was Smallville, which, despite being a popular show, was helped by being based off the Superman property. Heroes was an entirely new IP, not based on any pre-existing comic book or graphic novel, but wasn't shy of taking inspiration from said medium. Kring wanted to take the narrative structure and magical superhuman abilities of comic books and combine them with a grounded, relatable setting of the modern world, to be about the effects these awakened powers would have on seemingly ordinary citizens and how that played into a larger conflict. More of a character drama with superheroes than a show about superheroes. With the help of Lost co-creator Damon Lindelof, Kring pitched this concept to NBC executives who were immediately intrigued. They greenlit the show, and production on Heroes went full steam ahead. Wasting no time, they started by gathering notable writers such as Jeff Loeb, veteran comic book writer for acclaimed hits such as The Long Halloween, Hush, Superman for All Seasons, and Daredevil Yellow, along with working on the second season of Lost and is the current executive vice president of Marvel Television. He served as co-executive producer on Heroes and was largely responsible for the overall tone of the show, overlooking the writing process and bringing along his years of comic book expertise, making sure the powers were a balance of recognizable such as super strength and ones that weren't as well known, such as moving through solid matter. He really gave Heroes its own personality that resonated with two demographics, comic book fans and general audiences. Tim Kring knew that the geek fanbase was key, that the show would live or die based on their response because they would keep the show going. They would be the ones talking on forums or getting their fellow geeks to check out the show. Well, this is the fan base. This is the one that keeps the show really on the air. And, you know, they're the ones that tell their friends and go online and chat rooms and they create a kind of buzz and sort of viral quality to promotion of the show that you can't buy any, uh, any other way. Kring hadn't read much, if any, comic books throughout his lifetime, so having a producer who knew the ins and outs of the narrative structuring and tropes helped solidify the show as genuine. Fans of comic books could appreciate their hobby being used as an inspiration, while general audiences could be introduced to the medium through a television show that was grounded in reality. Jeff Loeb wouldn't just contribute his writing talents, but bring on a lifelong collaborator, one who would be essential in crafting the show's identity. Tim Sale, known for his art on Loeb's comics, was initially hired to do the storyboards for the show's pilot, giving a comic book feeling and pacing to the NBC pitch meeting. Once picked up, Tim Kring was so impressed that he asked Sale to have a larger part in the show's production, to be the artist behind the paintings that predict the future. There was a problem, though. Tim Sale is colorblind. He's an illustrator, not a colorist, preventing him from painting but was able to draw black and white versions of whatever they wanted that could be scanned on a canvas. That way his work could be colored in later on. 
The writers must have been aware of how the paintings added to the atmosphere of the show, as they would not only become an integral part of Volume 1, but be referenced throughout the show's existence. The writing process for each episode was also done in a somewhat unorthodox manner. Each member of the writing staff would have a character to write for per episode and once completed would be given to the episode writer to flow naturally in the final product, allowing for consistency along the characters throughout the 23 episode run and help speed up the production process. They would have up to 4 completed scripts at a time, with another one being written to keep them on track, meaning the cast and crew could film up to 9 scenes across various episodes on one set or location, which helped significantly as they were greenlit in May had to start filming by July and were on the air in September. Jesse Alexander, co-producer and writer, said this on the matter, on Heroes, where we have maybe 5 characters per episode and each episode has 4 beats, it's very easy to run out of time. On a serialized show, time is your ultimate enemy in the creative process because you want to think about where you're taking the characters, but you also have to get the episodes completed. See, making a good impression is paramount. This concept applies to almost every aspect of life, including television shows. If your audience isn't hooked by the first episode, they have no reason to keep watching. For example, DC aired a comedic take on the superhero genre called Powerless. It's a great idea in concept, following a company who helps protect people from collateral damage. The show's execution, however, was lackluster to say the least. The tone was inconsistent, the characters were unlikable, and it felt like a children's cartoon made for adults and not in the good way. Compare that to, say, Lost. The idea is okay, a plane crashes on a deserted island and the survivors need to band together, but the execution was absolutely stellar. It built its mystery in layers by throwing the audience in as much confusion as the rest of the characters. The show's discussions revolved around the mysteries that brought every episode. What's the smoke monster? Who are the others? Who sent the boat? Heroes, while having its own mysteries to solve, was not focused on an overarching mystery but a mission and leading their characters on adventures to achieve said goal, so they focused on making the show recognizable as opposed to just intriguing. The show's use of the solar eclipse was made into its primary logo giving it a symbol that A was instantly recognizable and B was directly linked within the narrative. The famous tagline, save the cheerleader, save the world, was a perfectly cheesy phrase that helped fans recognize each other and played a large part in the show's marketing, similar to the Star Wars May the Force be with you. The score by duo group Wendy and Lisa was another aspect that kept the show apart. Wendy and Lisa, former members of the Revolution, had brought the idea of taking inspiration from Indian and spiritual music that became popular in the early 70s, specifically with the use of the artist known as Shankar. Shankar is considered one of the major contributors to the popularization of Indian music in the West and is known for his violin and vocal majesty. The score now has become so identifiable that all you have to do is hear Shankar do that one note. That's Heroes. To me, that sounds just like Heroes. That's one man's voice. The score essentially built itself around the vocals Shankar provided, using them as a primary component of various themes and stinging motifs, giving Heroes an almost ethereal tone that the composer felt it lent itself towards, separating it from almost every other TV show at the time. In fact, I would be bold enough to say that without the score, Heroes would not have stood out as much as it did. The show would still do well, don't get me wrong, but compared to the down-to-earth tracks of most dramas, it had a massive leg up on its competition, and it showed through the show's overall reception. Heroes' first volume, Genesis, premiered on September 26, 2006. It was an instant worldwide sensation, racking in over 14 million viewers for its pilot and average viewership until a hiatus dropped it down to around 11 million. Yet for an entirely new IP, this was absolutely insane, and there are many reasons why this blew up. For starters, the show had a clear goal set from its opening that taps into the fears of the American public at the time after the events of 9-11, having a nuclear explosion in New York City that the main cast of characters had to stop, which kept the narrative focused on a single objective that all the other events could tie themselves around. After all, the mystery came from how the explosion would occur and who would set it off. 
Would it be from a man-made device, or would it be someone with the ability to cause it? Using the fear of an unpredictable attack on an American city that was still fresh in the minds of many over half a decade onward. Along with having a main villain, Silar, who actively sought out people with abilities, giving the writers a way to showcase different powers and have one constant threat that kept the characters on their toes. This brings us to the characters and how they're interwoven throughout the plot. Lost, despite having an ensemble cast, benefited from having many of said casts isolated in one location. Having characters meet up in the middle of the jungle didn't feel contrived because you knew they were all there on that island. Heroes had the task of having characters from all over the globe eventually interact without seeming forced. This was accomplished by making one character's path be the spine that kept the plot in order. That character was Peter Petrelli. Ensuring the conflict tied to him, his family, and his need to stop the explosion, while everyone else separated into groups and crossed into it at some point or another. Keeping the show's trajectory in place without feeling like it has no ending planned. Echoed by Jeff Loeb himself by stating he wanted each season to feel like its own graphic novel, a beginning, middle, and end, allowing new characters to take center stage with old ones returning. A great idea that would ultimately not come to pass and in my opinion was the show's biggest detriment. This is why the show had a balance of characters who represented different mentalities and how one responds to issues based on their life experiences, all of them based on archetypes throughout TV and comic books. You have characters like Hero and Peter who relish in the opportunity to be something special and are considered the heart and soul of Heroes and Run. An example of the classic superhero archetype like Superman or Spider-Man whose goals are to give on to others as much, if not more, than themselves. <laughs> Yet not everyone has the starry-eyed wonder that Hero and Peter have, which is exemplified through characters like Claire, Matt Parkman, Nikki, and Isaac, who view their powers as obstacles from leading an ordinary life or curses that cause nothing but trouble. There's no cure. We can't change the way you are. The only choice is to kill you. I wish you had. It wasn't just about people with powers though. You had characters such as Mohinder, who was tied to a central theme of the show, genetics. Being a geneticist, Mohinder brought a level of realism to the narrative. While the idea of superpowers coming from genetic evolution is far-fetched to say the least, it did add a slight element of believability instead of having the powers appear to, say, magic or an outside force. Similar to mutants like the X-Men, whose powers originate from evolution. The premise of the show was to be focused on the effects these abilities have on the everyday world and tying them to genetics with a fairly smooth explanation. Add to the mix a group of more than great characters such as Noah and Nathan Petrelli and a shadowy organization known as The Company and you had a recipe for an intriguing narrative filled with twists and turns. Yet, Hero Season 1, despite all the goodwill it has, wasn't exactly perfect. Characters dropped out of the show with little warning and others were introduced for no reason other than plot convenience like Hannah Gittleman. Nikki's storyline had the least to do with the overarching plot bringing many episodes to a grinding halt and the finale was clearly rushed. According to reports, Tim Kring wanted the finale to feel like a $90 million movie, but ultimately led to an anticlimactic showdown between Peter, Silar, and the surviving characters that could be best described as a slight punching contest, stab, boom, end. It was nowhere near as impactful as it could have been and was rightfully criticized. Despite a fairly weak ending though, Hero Season 1 was still seen as a great first outing for a brand new IP, one that could rival Lost and already had a legion of fans by the end of its 23 episode run. Rose tinted glasses may play a part in the belief that season 1 was perfect and everything else was bad, but it was a solid season that built up a unique world ripe with opportunities. Yet this momentum would not last, and fans would have to brace themselves for a bumpy road. 